All right, well, welcome everyone to the 45th annual Midwest Philosophy Colloquium. Uh, this year's topic is the philosophy of conspiracy theory. And we're very lucky to have uh, participating in this uh, series of events, some of the leading international experts in the field of philosophy and conspiracy theory. And so um, tonight's event is going to feature uh, Brian Keeley from Pitzer College where Brian is professor of philosophy and teaches in the philosophy, neuroscience, and science, technology, and society programs. Brian, uh, his research areas include not only this topic, the epistemology of conspiracy theories, but also philosophy of artificial life and artificial intelligence and the sciences of sensory perception. And uh, I would say he's the leading world philosopher on electric fish. So um, the plan for today is for Brian to give uh, a presentation about his recent work on the philosophy of conspiracy theory. And then we also have uh, the other um, philosophers who will serve as uh, lecturers in our future sessions also uh, are here to serve as panelists uh, to uh, do some brief discussion after Brian's talk. And then after that, we'll open up uh, the floor to the audience to ask questions. And so if you wanna ask a question, you can just post it in the Q&A and then we'll go through your questions uh, we get to the stage of um, getting uh, feedback from the audience. So uh, without any further ado, I'll let Brian take it from here. And the hosts um, will give the lecture again. And then after that, the panelists will turn their videos and sound on and will join the conversation. Okay, Brian. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for inviting me back to talk to folks in Minnesota about conspiracy theories. And, and if you're wondering how you become the world's best philosopher of electric fish is first of all you become the world's only philosopher on electric fish because i'm also the world's worst philosopher on electric fish i think because i'm pretty much the only one who uh, in philosophy who writes about that stuff but today uh, i want to talk about conspiracy theories and uh and my title is conspiracy theories and public trust and because i am the first of uh the folks talking about conspiracy theories from a philosophical perspective I wanted to do a little bit of stage setting. And so uh, a good part of my talk is just kind of bring us all up to speed on, on philosophers and conspiracy theories and how we should think about them. So the outline today, I hope is fairly straightforward. I'll do some introductory stuff, talk about conspiracies, conspiracy theories and conspiracy theory theory and explain what those all are. And then I will shift into a little discussion of uh, what I like to think of as of, of various myths associated with conspiracy theories and some considerations, some things to keep in mind when we're thinking about conspiracy theories and things that, uh, that we have learned in the last uh, 25 years or so of people kind of academically taking a serious look at conspiracy theories. And, and at the end, uh, I, I want to talk about something that's called the uh, public trust uh, approach. Uh, actually, here I have it as public trust argument. It's really a public trust approach, but it's a particular way of thinking about conspiracy theories and, and when they may be uh, warranted and when not. And that's going to be the part of the talk where I kind of present some new ideas. And I'm partly interested to see how uh, my panelists respond to it, because some of them have also written on this public trust approach and, and the stuff that I've said about it before. So let's jump into it. Uh, the first topic is conspiracies, conspiracy theories, and conspiracy theory theory. And the idea, of the, one, the first thing to kind of keep in mind is that conspiracies, more so than conspiracy theories, conspiracies have been around for pretty much as long as we've been social. Uh, ever since there have been multiple people together, uh, some of those people have secretly gotten together behind the backs of other people to carry things out, uh, usually to their benefit and sometimes to the detriment of the person that is kept out of the circle. So in many ways, conspiracies have been around as, as, as long as we've been around. Uh, and we find conspiracies all over the place in the history and in the world. Uh, pretty much any time there's a coup d'etat or, or even just a coup attempt, uh, criminal conspiracies, uh, there are all sorts of business conspiracies, uh, extramarital affairs, very often extramarital affairs are conspiratorial in the sense that two people uh, are keeping their relationship a secret from a third person. Also cases of espionage and confidence schemes. I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which people uh, conspire 
with one another to carry out things that uh, they want to profit from. But the idea of conspiracy theories, these are theories about conspiracies. That's come on, come in recent years, at least in the 20th century, it's come to have a kind of very much more specific meaning. And part of what we'll be talking about today is the different aspects of that meaning. Uh, and academics by and large have not paid that much attention historically to conspiracy theories. And when I, when I actually first started looking into conspiracy theories as something to philosophically engage with, I, you know, I did, went to the library and I did a search and I pretty much only found two people that had uh, said much in philosophy about conspiracy theories. And one of them was Sir Karl Popper. And then the other is one other one of our panelists, uh, Charles Pigden, who had written a paper about what Sir Karl Popper uh, had said about conspiracy and conspiracy theories. So in many ways, uh, Popper was our you know, first, first conspiracy theory theorist, somebody who was thinking about the nature of conspiracy theories. And, and it's not in his, his works on the philosophy of science, it's more his more political philosophy book, uh, his two volume, The Open Society and Its Enemies. And in that book, there's a passage, it's not very long, it's just a couple of pages, where he talks about different accounts of history and different accounts of society and the ways in which we can understand what happens in society. And he identifies this thing that he calls the conspiracy theory of society. And this is quote, uh, it, this is the view, or it is the view that whatever happens in society are the results of, a, of direct design by some powerful individuals or groups. Right? This idea that, that, that you find in, uh, in politics and political theory, where people explain what's happening and maybe or what has happened in the past by looking at for conspiracies where people have secretly gotten together and carried out some event. And so it's no surprise that probably the most famous person in the 20th century to talk about conspiracy theories actually never, as far as I know, used that term, but instead uh, talked about something that's clearly the same idea. And this is the work of a historian, a political historian, Richard Hofstetter, and he warned uh, in an important paper in the 1964 about movements of suspicious discontent. And he's particularly looking at uh, the late 19th century and early and mid 20th century American politics. And he identifies what he calls the paranoid style of thinking uh, that this idea that you see particularly, and, and he, he notes that it's not just the right wing, but the right wing as well as the left wing, although he notes that the right wing uh, in the 1960s seemed to be particularly good at it uh, and particularly uh, engaged with it well. Uh, this idea that uh, they're worried that groups of people are uh, out to change things. Usually uh, these are theories held by disaffected constituencies of one sort or another. So there are these early discussants of something about politics, American politics perhaps, uh, whereby uh, people are proposing to explain what they see going on around them or what has happened in the past by referring to conspiracies of one sort or another. And these are your conspiracy theories. But as I said, these are really the only academics. So there was a couple of others, uh, just a few outside of, of academia, or excuse me, outside of philosophy, uh, people like Popper, but also uh, historians and also uh, uh, political scientists and others. But it really wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century in the early part of the 20, or 21st century, excuse me, that uh, I, th I think, and, and, and M can tell us whether I'm right about this, but I think M coined this term conspiracy theory theories or conspiracy theory theorists. And it's a, you know, it's a funny sounding little name, but it, the idea is to talk about the theory of conspiracy theories, to try to figure out what it, what's going on with conspiracy theories, why do people hold them, uh, what, uh, if you're a philosopher, what epistemic grounds are there for believing or disbelieving a given conspiracy theory. But, uh, and by the way, this is, uh, appears in uh, M's book, uh, The Philosophy of Conspiracy Theories. It came out a number of years ago, but it's still a very nice book length discussion of the kind of philosophical issues in particular that are raised by conspiracy theories. And uh, he also identifies these different aspects of conspiracy theory, excuse me, identifies these aspects of, of conspiracy theory theory, the idea that these are people who are studying conspiracy theories. And I hear kind of bring together, just if you're curious, the number, number of different areas, and this is not exclusive, this is just kind of what I've seen out there. Uh, as we've mentioned, there are uh, philosophers, 
such as, uh, uh, well, we, a lot of them are on our panels. Uh, so Charles Pignan, M. Dentith, uh, uh, David Cody, Steve Clark, uh, but also others, uh, Kwasim Kassam has written an interesting book recently on conspiracy theories. Lee Basham has written about it. There's a number of other philosophers as well, and some of them I'll be talking about today. But also you find historians, people like Catherine Olmsted, who's written about conspiracy theories in American history. Uh, Philip Sheenan has written on particularly things like the Kennedy assassination and other events. But then there are other fields as well. People in media studies and in cultural studies have talked about uh, trying to understand this phenomenon of, of conspiracy theories. In political science, obviously we've already mentioned the political science dimensions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, the work of Joe Yasinski. Also social psychologists, Karen Douglas, Brotherton, uh, and social uh, sociology and anthropology, law and policy. So there's a lot of different fields. And the, the thing they all have in common is they're all looking at this phenomenon of conspiracy theories and, and trying to kind of piece together a story here to figure out what exactly is going on with, the, uh, with conspiracy theories and what's going on in our culture. So as I say, uh, Conspiracy theory as a kind of a standalone concept seems to be largely a 20th century phenomenon. But one question that comes up pretty quickly is, okay, so it's something we see in the 20th century, but surely now at the beginning of the 21st century in 2021, uh, we must be at peak conspiracy theory. There seems to be a lot of them. And it's certainly something that you see all the time in newspapers, of, 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 in the media reports about conspiracy theories that like you're, you're, there's now more conspiracy theories than ever, or perhaps there's more buy-in to conspiracy theories. But part of the problem with that claim is that it's really hard to get good data on this question of you know, the relative uh, popularity or the relative uh, interest in conspiracy theories at any given time, especially given that we are you know, we're, we definitely need to watch out for the, uh, the fallacy of presentism, where people consistently like to think that there's something different about the times that they're living in. The time that they're living in is special in a variety of ways. And we certainly seem to think that we're living in a special time now with conspiracy theories. But as I say, there's not a lot of good data as to whether we're uh, seeing more conspiracy theory activity now than before. One of the few bits of data that we have comes from those uh, some, some political uh, scientists, uh, the two Joes, Joe Yasinski and Joseph Parent, uh, who did this work when they both were at the University of Miami. And they did this great book called American Conspiracy Theories, looking at the political science of conspiracy theories, particularly in the American context. And they you know, tried to do what good social scientists do. They, they tried to find some data so that they can answer these questions. And in the book, they describe the results of some studies they did. And, and it's really a fascinating thing that they decided to do. They decided to look at uh, letters to the editor uh, in the New York Times and uh, one other, it may, may have been the Washington Post, but there was two um, letters to the editor sections. And that the idea is this was a corpus that was available to them going the all the way back. Chicago Tribune. What, which, what, what was it? It's the Chicago Tribune. That's right, the Chicago Tribune, thank you. Uh, so looked at these two papers and looked at letters to the editor that had been published starting in the 1890s and running up until 2010 and, and looked to see if they could figure out you know, whether there were uh, trends in conspiracy theory. So they would look through all these letters, they looked at all the published letters, they coded them. You know, this is what graduate students are good for. Uh, you get them to go in and read all these things and code them and code them for conspiracy theories being mentioned in the letters. And at least according to this data that they were able to collect, it's not a perfect data set. It's got a lot of problems in a lot of ways, but again, it, it's not really clear exactly how you want to measure this. But according to their studies, if you notice that the big peak for conspiracy theories actually is happening in the 1950s, uh, at least in the United States, and presumably these are conspiracy theories having to do with the Red Scare, the idea that the commies are in our uh, political, you know, this is McCarthyism, the height of McCarthyism and uh, communist uh, being inside of our US government, that sort of thing. Uh, and at least in terms of letters to the editor, that's when you saw more of that than anything else. Back in the 1890s, there were a lot of conspiracies having to do with the money supply. Uh, so, you know, William Jennings Bryant and his cross of gold speech and the kind of worries about uh, powers of people interfering with our uh, financial system in one way or the other. And then things are pretty even after that. 
But that's one data set. Uh, another thing that I just went and took a look at recently is some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, Google Books. Google Books has scanned uh, pretty much everything in the English language and also in, uh, in British English and other sources as well. And then using that data set created by their scanning, they have these things called ingrams that some of people may be familiar with, where you can look at uh, the percentage of uh, occurrences of certain phrases. So I just did a quick search looking over uh, just the last 100 years. So from 1919 to 2019, looking specifically at American English, and what you see is the incidence of either conspiracy theory or conspiracy theories, uh, there's definitely been an upward trend. So the last data set was looking at newspapers. This is looking at published books. And we definitely see an upward trend uh, in the percentage of books that mention the phrase conspiracy theory or conspiracy theories. So maybe that's some evidence that it is uh, growing more and more. Uh, just for the heck of it, I did this, which was uh, looking at certain conspiracy theories and seeing what uh, how they looked over. This is now over the last 50 years. So going back to 1969 to, to 2019 and looking at a number of different conspiracy theories. The problem with this method is that it's hard to parse out things that are just other uses of a particular phrase because it's not doing anything semantic. It's just lo looking for strings of letters uh, that are found in the text. So uh, there are a lot of conspiracy theories that we could have looked at, but they're, they're, they're using the same words as something else. So I tried to pick ones like chemtrail or uh, Illuminati or uh, birther or birthers, which kind of have a, a specific name associated with them to see how they uh, change over time. And, and yeah, this is kind of interesting over the last 50 years. I mean, uh, it looks like Illuminati has always been kind of something that people have been writing about in Google Books. Uh, the Earth is flat. Actually, it looks like it's taken a little downturn in just the last couple of years, but it also goes back quite a ways. Uh, this is this blue line. Uh, let me see, get my pointer. Uh, this blue line here is the black helicopter, uh, which was uh, the idea of black helicopters flying over America was something that uh, was a conspiracy theory trope starting in the 1980s. And you can see it here in books about that. Uh, birther and birther, birtherism kind of seems to be takes off in uh, the early 2000s. And then you see down here, Pizzagate and QAnon, uh, all not really showing much of any uh, action until 2010 or so. Uh, chemtrails kind of goes back to the 90s. Uh, but as I say, this is a flawed methodology in a lot of ways, just because uh, you're, you're getting all reference to this. Obviously, people talk about black helicopters in contexts that have nothing to do with conspiracy theories. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, kind of, of interesting showing kind of different uh, data about conspiracy theories and how things look now is versus the way they looked in the past. So let me turn to the second, um, the second part of the talk, which is some myths and considerations. And these are some things that I think, that at least when I look at the conspiracy theory theory literature, these are the things that kind of jump out at me. Uh, and so I thought I'd present them and we'll see what, uh, what again, the panelists think of these things. So the first myth is the idea that conspiracy theory itself is a well-defined concept. Uh, this just does not seem to be the case, that what we mean by conspiracy theory, uh, particularly as it's used on the ground and as it's used in things like journalism, uh, is not so clearly and, and carefully defined. So for example, here's one of my favorite examples. This was from uh, Wired Magazine or actually Wired.com a number of years ago. And it's one of these listicles that you sometimes see on the internet. And this was about the MH370 uh, uh, Malaysian airline flight that was flying to China that disappeared and, and, and under mysterious circumstances. And uh, a couple of years ago now, and this was a, uh, an article they had basically was looking at the most logical and craziest MH370 conspiracy theories. And so, you know, cockpit fire was one, uh, the idea that the, Rus the Russian special ops took it and, you know, kid you know, basically kidnapped it and flew it somewhere. Uh, some people thought there was, it was kidnapped and taken to Pakistan. Others thought that maybe it was like the KAL flight uh, in back in the 1980s, the US military shot it down either on accident or on purpose. Uh, maybe a meteor hit it was another theory. And apparently CNN anchor Don Lemon suggested on air that maybe it was, it was gobbled up by a black hole. And 
one thing you should notice about this list is that some of these theories don't seem to have anything to do with conspiracies. Uh, I mean, okay, yeah, Russian spe special ops ticket or the US military shot it down. There's presumably some kind of a conspiracy behind that, if that were the case. But then other things like the black hole or the meteor, I mean, that's a, an unusual theory about MH370, but it's not really a conspiracy theory. It's, it's a, just an unusual theory, a theory that seems maybe implausible, but it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the conspiracy. And I, uh, as, um, as Jesse Walker puts it, he, that this term kind of has been morphing back and forth, or at least morphing in particular directions uh, over uh, the, the last couple of decades. So he, what he says about conspiracy theories is that its meaning constantly stretches and narrows, particularly when it is used as a pejorative. You know, people uh, call somebody a conspiracy theorist that usually is uh, supposed to be a negative term about them, or to call your explanation of conspiracy theories, it's supposed to be a pejorative. So this is the direction in which our language has been evolving. People started using the phrase conspiracy theory to mean implausible conspiracy theory, then implausible theory, whether or not it involves a conspiracy at all. Meanwhile, they leave out those implausible theories that have a lot of cultural cachet, such as stories about cults, gangs, or terrorists, right? When people blame things on cults or blame things on gang activity, uh, they often don't refer to those as conspiracy theories, even though they sometimes involve conspiracies. He says, why has this happened? Well, I can only speculate. It is surely notable though that the combined effect is to underline the idea that conspiracy theories are something for those people way out on the far left or the far right. Conspiratorial thinking is perceived not as a widespread human trait, but as the province of a peculiar personality type, not as a mass phenomenon, but as a fringe phenomenon. Conspiracy starts just to mean fringe, according to uh, Walker, or at least this is what he sees when he looks at uh, the use of, of um, conspiracy theories and that term as it, as it shows up. How am I going to define it? Uh, I generally try to take a pretty hands-off kind of a non-pejorative way of defining it. Uh, so I define it this way, uh, conspiracy theories of, is a proposed explanation of some historical event or events in terms of the significant causal agency of a relatively small group of persons, that is the conspirators acting in secret. So notice that this definition is neutral as to how plausible the theory is, uh, whether it is a theory that you ought to believe in. And I think we need to make a distinction between what I sometimes call warranted conspiracy theories and unwarranted conspiracy theories. And what I wanna say is that we need a neutral definition of conspiracy theories. It just says any theory that invokes a conspiracy and then once we have that on the table, our question as epistemic agents is to figure out which ones we should believe in. Certain conspiracies, for example, Watergate, uh, is a that's a conspiracy theory that we should accept. And other conspiracy theories, perhaps, let me just throw one out, the moon landing hoax, we say, okay, that maybe is an unwarranted conspiracy theory, or here's, here's the view that I take on it. So you have a kind of a neutral definition of the concept, and then you go after the, uh, the, the, the normative side of things. What should we uh, claim has warrant and what not? Also notice you can, you can, you can add in a few things. If this, if this is too general a definition for you, if you wanna narrow things down more, uh, one thing that some theorists wanna do is they, might, they add in, uh, you need a, a, a malevolent intent. So we don't want to necessarily count surprise birthday parties or anonymous charitable work as uh, being the kinds of conspiracies or conspiracy theories that we're concerned with. So, you know, presumably there's no malevolent uh, intent behind a surprise birthday party and charitable work presumably does not have a malevolent intent. So we can rule those out by saying, okay, we're going to add that into our definition and, 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 and say that those are not the sort of things we're talking about. Um, and also partly what I want to do is, is fight back against that thing that Jesse Walker is looking at, this, this kind of tendency to use the term in a pejorative way, uh, because I worry that that's gonna force us or and tempt us to beg the question in a lot of cases where we wanna be careful not to. Because uh, here's the problem or one version of the problem, right? We can uh, imagine a situation where the conspiracy theory is a new conspiracy theory. Uh, imagine it's, you know, sometime in the early 1970s uh, and uh, somebody reads in the newspaper that a bunch of people have broken into uh, the Watergate building in Washington, D.C. 
And then as you're reading the story to your friend uh, at the at the coffee table, uh, they look at you and they go, I think Nixon was behind it. You know, that guy, yeah, he's up to no good. I bet you he's behind this. And proposing that there's some kind of a conspiracy behind the break-in of the Watergate building, the DNC, the Democrat National Convention in the Watergate building. Well, in that first day, it's just a theory about a conspiracy. Uh, we don't know on that particular day whether that's going to turn out to be a warranted conspiracy theory or an unwarranted conspiracy theory. People are going to have to do some work, you know, and it turns out, you know, Woodward and Bernstein go out and do their work. Uh, you know, Deep Throat comes along and starts to uh, help them out and, and as an insider that has uh, some whistleblowing that he wants to do. And then lo and behold, you know, many years later, you've got me telling you that, you know, Watergate is a real conspiracy that really happened. We ought to believe in it. It's a conspiracy theory that is definitely warranted to believe. Maybe there are certain details about it that might be up, open for question, but that it happened seemed to be uh, a, a reasonable thing. But on the day that the, the day the report in the reports are showing that a break in has happened, on that day you should be epistemically epistemically neutral. You can identify it as a conspiracy theory, but you don't know whether it's one that you you ultimately ought to believe or or not. And on that particular day, you don't have evidence one way or the other, except for you know evidence about the the, the past history of potential people that are involved uh, that might start to give you a hint as to which way to think about it. And some other things uh, in, in this idea that it's a well-defined concept, uh, other things that are involved. Uh, some people think that it's important that there be a set of competing explanations, that there should always be a, a, an official story, that the conspiracy theory should always be defined against some kind of official story. Uh, that's problematic in a lot of different ways because it's trying to figure out exactly what constitute official, right? Is if the president of the United States tweets it, does that mean it's now official and therefore can't be a conspiracy theory? Uh, I, I'm not somebody who is partial to the idea that we need to necessarily have an official story as part of our way of defining conspiracy theories, uh, but some others in, in the literature do think that's important. And I also, in earlier work, have argued that you know, there's a variety of different things that are often the starting point uh, for different conspiracy theories. Often there are things like errant or missing data. There are things that are unexplained by that official story. The official story is often there, uh, and it is often something that gets the conspiracy theory going, but it's, it's not a necessary condition. But often you'll see an official story, and the official story fails to, to explain something and so or, or, or just leave something as a coincidence. And that might bug you. And you might think, oh, that couldn't have just been a coincidence. There must have be intentionality behind it. But as uh, uh, Francis Crick used to like to say, uh, you don't want your theory to fit all the data because not all the data is true. Uh, Francis Crick was talking about the fact that humans collect data. And when we collect data, we often make mistakes because we're human. And so he actually was worried that theories need to be careful not to overfit the data because that itself would be suspicious. But one of the useful things about conspiracy theories, as I think about them, is that they take advantage of certain things that we see in the philosophy of science, uh, in particular, this virtue of explanatory reach, that one of the key virtues of good scientific explanation often is that it explains more than just the phenomenon in front of it. Uh, that if you want to understand something like uh, uh, the theory of gravity, it's a great thing if your theory can also explain why the tides act the way that they do, right? That a, that a good theory sometimes branches out and explains other things. And conspiracy theories often have that in spades. And part of my diagnosis of what happens in conspiracy theories when they go wrong is that they kind of overplay their hand with respect to certain virtues uh, that they have, that, uh, that they are kind of pushing things a little bit too far, or at least that becomes grounds for being worried about this particular conspiracy theory not being uh, something that we should believe in. And then the final thing, at least in terms of this first myth, first myth about how to define them is pointing out that there are kind of a distinction that's developed in the literature and the conspiracy theory, theory literature in the number, uh, last number of years. Um, I believe it traces back to Bunting and Taylor in 2010. And they think there's, we need to make an important distinction between what they call particularism and generalism. And according to the generalist rationality or the rationality of conspiracy theories can be accessed without considering particular conspiracy theories. That on this view, conspiratorial thinking is in essence irrational. So just knowing that something is a conspiracy theory 
already undermines its epistemic believability, that there's something wrong about the class of conspiracy theories such that they are literally incredible. They are not believable. Against that, there are those who think that, no, we need to distinguish something from that. Another thing you can, another approach that you can take is a particularist approach. And this denies that the rationality of conspiracy theories can be assessed without first considering particular conspiracy theories. That is to say, the particularist claims that no matter our views about conspiracy theories in general, we cannot dismiss particular conspiracy theories. Rather, we must evaluate each of them on their individual merits. And part of the debate over conspiracy theories is sometimes a debate about generalism versus particularism. The idea of whether conspiracy theories as a class should be dismissed or not, or whether if, as I'm pushing at least, the idea that, that we need to take each uh, conspiracy theory on its own, that, that we need to look at the data and then decide whether or not we accept a given uh, conspiracy theory. We may still reject conspiracy theories, but only after doing uh, our due diligence. And I should also note that, this, that when people use conspiracy theory as a pejorative in the way that uh, uh, we just saw a few minutes ago, that idea seems to presume a form of generalism, that, that this by calling it a conspiracy theory, you're, you're, you're tarring it with a particular brush of saying, oh yeah, it's one of the bad theories. That, and that's, uh, again, something that philosophers have pointed out in the conspiracy theory theory literature uh, that, we need to be careful about how we use it. And I think I wouldn't be surprised if most of the people on our panel uh, identify as particularist of one sort or another, but maybe we will, we will hear from them and they can tell us. So what's the second myth? Uh, so first is the idea of whether conspiracy theory is a well-defined concept. The second myth is related, the idea that conspiracy theorist or the group of conspiracy theorists is itself a well-defined group. Um, and again, conspiracy, people in conspiracy theory literature uh, point to ways in which this probably can't be right, that it's probably not as well-defined a group of people. We talk about conspiracy theorists all the time. Certainly, again, in the media, you'll see reference to conspiracy theorists. But figuring out exactly who's being referred to is not always so clear. And so one of our panelists, uh, Charles Pignan, uh, and he may talk about this in his talk, uh, in his forward, actually, to uh, Matthew's book, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, he basically proposed a dilemma whereby pretty much all of us are conspiracy theorists, or at least all of us ought to be conspiracy theorists. And he basically proposed a kind of a dilemma for folks. And it's that dilemma is based on the fact that history is just full of conspiracies, that you look at the history, as I mentioned, all the way back at the beginning, everything from marital affairs to coup d'etats to assassinations to all sorts of things going on in business and politics. I mean, the, the study of history in many ways is a study of a variety of different conspiracies. And with that as a background, Charles points to this potential dilemma, which is you're forced to either accept, well, here are the premises, right? Unless you believe that the reports of the history books and the nightly news are largely false, you are a conspiracy theorist, since history and nightly news are chock-a-block with conspiracies. Or perhaps premise two, if you do believe that the reports of the history books and the nightly news are largely false, then you are again a conspiracy theorist because you presumably believe that somebody is conspiring to fake, fake those history books and fake those news reports. So given that kind of background, the fact that history books and news reports are full of conspiracies and reports of conspiracies, then it seems like you either believe them, in which case you're a conspiracy theorist, or you disbelieve them, in which case you're a conspiracy theorist, because how else do you explain why they're talking about them so much? So there's one sense in which everybody is a conspiracy theorist on, on this reading. But if you don't like that, uh, that kind of argument, that seems a little too quick and fast for you. Uh, if you look at the political science data on conspiracies and conspiracy theories, uh, we find a lot of evidence that it's a pretty wide ranging group. So this is from Oliver and Wood. Uh, they say that we find that half of the American public consistently endorses at least one conspiracy theory. In contrast with many theoretical speculations, we do not find conspiracism to be a product of greater authoritarianism, ignorance, or political conservatism. Uh, and they reported this back in 2014. Uh, Adam Berensky uh, reports very similar results. Uh, although I will notice that this talks about uh, American public. 
Uh, one of the questions that we probably need to answer in this uh, series of talks is why so many folks from down under seem to be interested in the philosophy of conspiracy theories. I think I may be the only member of this panelist that isn't from either New Zealand or Australia. And uh, that's an interesting fact that we may need to explore later on. Another set of political scientists, as I mentioned before, are Joe Yusinski and Joe Parent. And uh, they again argue that uh, conspiracy theories seem to be pretty widespread across a variety of different uh, groups of people. And when they go to identify uh, who are the conspiracy theorists or who has a tendency to believe in conspiracy theorists, their bumper sticker slogan is the obviously provocative uh, conspiracy theories are for losers. And that's not meant in a normative sense, but it's supposed to be a factual claim that when your power, when your group of people, when your political tribe uh, lose power, for example, in democratic societies, when your party loses the elections and then the other party uh, takes over or one of the other parties takes over, then the your interest in conspiracy theories and your your tendency to find them believable go up considerably. Uh, and when your party is in charge, uh, they go down. Uh, one of the interesting things is they wrote this book before the rise of Donald, Donald Trump, uh, and uh, they've been kind of saying some interesting things to try to explain how it is that uh, Donald Trump actually won the election uh, in 2016, and yet conspiracy theories uh, seem to, if only, got, got even stronger uh, in, in their buy-in from at least certain parts of the American public. Um, but they think that they've got some, some explanations as to why that's the case and their thesis may not be completely off the, uh, off the ball. So, so um, the other thing to consider when we're thinking about how to identify this group of people, uh, one thing is I, kind of, uh, I'm using a bit of a pejorative by talking about your crazy uncle. First of all, that's ableist language. Uh, and I'm doing that on purpose in order to show that uh, we often are, are using it in a very pejorative sort of sense as if there is something wrong here. But it seems prudent, at least according to some people in the conspiracy theory, theory literature, to distinguish between the psychological attitude of the theorist as opposed to the actual uh, theories produced by those people. So Daniel Pipes, I believe, is responsible for coming up with this uh, distinction between conspiracism and conspiracy theories. And he says that, you know, conspiracy theories have a way of growing on a person to the point that they become a way of seeing life itself. This is conspiracism, the paranoid style re uh, reaching back to Hofstetter or the hidden hand mentality that when we're talking about conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists, that we need to be very careful to distinguish are we talking about the theories that are being presented or are we talking about the, uh, the persons presenting those theories and doing things with them? And a third consideration while thinking through who is this group of people that we're talking about and why is that relevant to keep in mind uh, is to think about that this actually points to a bit of a split within the conspiracy theory theory uh, field itself, which is that if we, we should keep in mind there's at least three different elements involved uh, with any given conspiracy theory. There's the theorist themselves, there's the theory that they're proponing, propo uh, that, they're, that they're a proponent of, and then finally there's the thing that the theory is about, that these are three separate elements of any given conspiracy theory. And the social sciences, social psychology, political science, sociology, those sorts of things are often focused on the first to the exclusion of the second. They're often very focused on the theorist and then pay relatively little attention to the nature of the theory itself. And I also observe that sometimes philosophers and or very often philosophers are the other way around that philosophers tend to focus on the second, on the theory, uh, much to the exclusion of, of one, the actual theorist. And I, I will definitely claim to be guilty of that. And then, as I point out, historians are really good at reminding us about, you know, what these theories are theories about. Uh, and, you know, you look at the history and it is very much focused on that third thing very often. What actually did happen uh, and what evidence do we have for it uh, and, and which of the theories seems to turn out to be the best one. The third myth I want to share with you is the idea that conspiracy theories are unfalsifiable and are therefore in some sense or another bad theories. And 
and this is something that you hear uh, very often when talking about conspiracy theories, that uh, it actually goes back to Popper again. Uh, even though Popper didn't make this point, you can't help but thinking that Popper may have had it in the back of his mind uh, because he's famous for developing this idea in the philosophy of science, the idea of falsifiability. And so according to Popper, what makes scientific theories, for example, astronomy, different from non-scientific ones, say astrology, is that genuine scientific theories make risky predictions and then specify the conditions of their falsification. This is the idea that what a good scientist do does is generate a hypothesis formed in such a way that it can go out and be tested. And the more risky such a test is, uh, the better your theory or the better, the more credentials your theory should have, uh, that really what scientists should be doing is not trying to confirm theories. What they should be trying to do is disconfirm theories because the hallmark of science, according to Popper, is that theories be falsifiable. So that the good theories are the theories that we've attempted to falsify, that we could in principle falsify, but then when we go out and do the work, it turns out we fail to falsify them. So therefore we think, okay, this is a pretty good theory, at least, you know, at least until we find out that it's false uh, and, uh, and we should always continue to do our studies. Um, so one of the ways in which the generalists about conspiracy theories uh, go is they argue that uh, at least one argument against it is that, well, conspiracy theories by their nature are not falsifiable. Uh, they are the only theories for which evidence against them is taken as evidence in favor of them. And, uh, and, and that this is seen as a, uh, you know, a, a, a damning uh, indictment of conspiracy theories. And the generalist says, aha, that shows that all conspiracy theories are incredible because they are not falsifiable. In the same way that uh, in uh, past years, uh, people wondered about the, uh, the falsifiability of either evolution by natural se selection or intelligent design theory, right? The, the accusations on both sides got thrown around that the other side's theory was not falsifiable uh, and, and this was you know, a bad thing. But of course, that is in the realm of, of science, right? If we're trying to understand uh, the evolution of life on Earth, that is a you know, presumably within the scientific domain. And Popper is talking about what's going on in the scientific domain. So that seems appropriate, perhaps. But we're not doing science when we are often dealing with the things that are associated with conspiracy theories. Uh, so as I say, the domain of historical or social explanation is just not the same domain as natural scientific explanation. And there are important differences that we want to keep in mind. Uh, as I point, like to point out, you know, Neptune and smallpox simply don't know that we're investigating them, nor do they mount disinformation campaigns uh, as uh, coup plotters uh, or the CIA do, right? That, that the things that are being studied in natural science are things which are unaware of our studying them. That's not the case when it comes to the things that the social sciences study. That's one of the reasons why the social sciences are hard is because your actual subjects might be reading your results and reading your textbooks and having gotten majors in your field such that you might worry that that contaminates their responses to the kinds of studies you're doing. So the, as I say, the worry of unfalsifiability uh, is often actually talked about as a, as a feature of the theorists, that there's something wrong about the theorists, that it's not that the theory is unfalsifiable, but there's something wrong about the psychology of the theorists themselves. That's the idea behind conspiracism, that the conspiracism is a claim about the traits of theorists such that they see a conspiracy around every corner and that they're generally, you know, this is the paranoid style that Hofstetter uh, talks about. But if we're interested in, but the, the falsifiability claim is a claim about theories. Uh, so not only is it not even claims about the kinds of theories that often cons cons conspiracy theories are about, it's often not even about the conspiracy theories at all. It's more a claim about something about the gullibility or the uh, tendencies of the people that are promulgating those theories. So this, this claim of falsifiability, I think it just doesn't uh, doesn't really work, or at least we need to, to hear a lot more before we, we should buy it. So good, I think I'm doing okay for time. So let me, that's all by way of kind of setup and, and maybe some of this will be useful for the talks going forward. Uh, certainly uh, any of the panelists should uh, jump in and uh, at the end of the talk and, and say anything they wanna say about why they think this is not the right way to set it up but I was trying to be helpful uh, and set things up for folks coming down the line doing these other talks. 
But let me end uh, by talking a little bit about the thing I promised to talk about, the public trust uh, approach. Uh, like I said, again, I call it here the public trust argument. It really should be the public trust approach. And this forces me to kind of circle back a little bit and what is my own, what are my own views about uh, conspiracy theories and whether they're warranted or not. I've given you a, a somewhat of a picture up to this point. I mean, I've been talking about conspiracy theory theory more generally, but I think along the way, I've kind of given you some of my own uh, take on things. But just to be explicit, uh, my own view is that that there's a mix of warranted and unwarranted conspiracy theories. So there are a number of warranted conspiracy theories. Watergate, I've mentioned before, Iran-Contra, uh, and others. Um, and then there are also, intermixed with them, or there are a variety of unwarranted conspiracy theories. Uh, I mentioned the moon landing hoax. Uh, also, my original paper, I talked about the idea of the that the alcohol, tobacco, and firearm department was behind the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. Either they caused it to happen or they mistakenly allowed it to happen. Uh, I think those are unwarranted conspiracy theories for the reasons that I, I spell out uh, in earlier papers. I also, as I mentioned before, I am a largely a particularist, particularist. I think it takes time to sort out the warranted conspiracy theories from the unwarranted conspiracy theories. Uh, we have to do investigative work very often uh, to figure out what category we want to put a particular conspiracy theory in. But there is one view that I've been charged with uh, for uh, a long time and that I don't actually hold and I wanted to kind of explore a little bit what this, uh, this view is uh, and Basically, I mean, all I can chalk it up to is that I should have written more clearly because a number of different people, including people on this panel, uh, have said that this is a view that I held uh, based on what I've written. Uh, so let me try to uh, try to explain what I meant to say. So let's define, uh, just for the purposes of being able to talk about these things, let's define institutions of public trust. So an institution of public trust, as I want to define it, is some social institution uh, which is to some degree accountable to the public that takes as an important goal to prom the promotion of the public's trust vis-a-vis -vis factual claims. So think about you know the US FBI, which after all is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, right? Uh, they are the uh, Federal Bureau that investigates crimes at the federal level. Uh, also various organs of journalism, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Sydney Herald, right? They, they are journalists uh, and particularly investigative journalists, 60 Minutes in the United States and in other uh, countries as well. Uh, journalists who uh, to some degree are publicly accountable and seeking to uh, engage with the trust of, of the public around factual claims. Or not, just to give another example, the US National Transportation and Safety Board, the, the NTSB, uh, who we look to to find facts about airplane crashes and train crashes and other things. And I don't think it's it's uh, going out on a limb to say that there clearly has to be some kind of relationship between beliefs in conspiracy theories on the one hand, or at least beliefs in particular conspiracy theories on the one hand, and the degree of trust in these uh, IPTs on the other. That often uh, belief in a particular conspiracy theory is gonna come with a particular attitude about the trustworthiness of uh, institutions of public trust. And so I wrote about this in, in my first paper uh, on conspiracy theories many, many years ago. And, and from this, people have uh, derived, uh, I didn't call it this, but other people, I think uh, maybe Juha uh, coined this term, but coined this idea of the public trust approach to understanding and, and evaluating conspiracy theories. And according to uh, Juha, this is the view that most political conspiracy theories should be rejected on the grounds that they embody, quote, an almost nihilistic degree of skepticism about the behavior and motivations of other people and the social institutions they constitute. And that quote is a quote of me, right? So he's quoting me and saying, I hold this view that conspiracy theories should be rejected on the grounds that they embody an, an, a nihilistic degree of skepticism about the behavior and motivations of other people. And he's not alone in this. Uh, here's another place, another paper where he talks about this. Uh, he's talking about now the critics of the point of view that, uh, that's been attributed to me, that the critics have opposed Keeley's argument by denying that belief in a conspiracy theory entails skepticism, and by claiming that skepticism of people and institutions is actually unproblematic, as we have excellent historical reason not to trust 
the public institutions and authorities, right? That there's something wrong in my argument if I'm saying that uh, we, that uh, the, the f there's something wrong in my argument in the claim that I'm making for a connection between public trust and institutions of public trust and conspiracy theories and their believability. And you see even further, uh, this is actually from the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So this one really hurts. Uh, so in the Encyclopedia of, of uh, Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, uh, Mark Polly, who writes an entry on conspiracy theories, writes, uh, and he's, he talks about it in terms of institutional trust, but he says the starting point of the discussion of institutional trust is Keeley who argues that the problem with conspiracy theories is that these theories cast doubt on precisely those institutions which are the guarantors of reliable data. If a conspiracy theory contradicts an official theory based on scientific expertise, this produces skepticism not only with regard to the institution of science, but may also produce skepticism with regard to other public institutions, for example, the press, which accepts the official story instead of uncovering the conspiracy, the parliament and the government, which produce or propagate the conspiracy theory in the first place. Thus the claim that believing in a conspiracy theory implies, uh, let's start that over again. Thus the claim that is that believing in a conspiracy theory implies a quite widespread distrust in our public institutions. If this implication is true, it can be used in two ways, either to discredit the conspiracy theory, which is the route Keeley advocates, or to discredit our public institutions. In any case, our trust in public institutions will influence the extent to which we hold a particular conspiracy theory to be likely. And the, my problem with this analysis is that it, it plays on an ambiguity. And like I said, I take responsibility. I probably should have been clearer uh, about what I was arguing. But there's an ambiguity when you say that a X entails Y. Because sometimes that sounds like, and some of the readings that we just read suggest that X leads to Y, uh, and therefore you shouldn't believe Y. But there's another, there's, there's another way of reading X entails Y, which is that Y presupposes X. Uh, and so what I thought I was doing when I made that argument originally and, and, and have continued to make arguments like this along the way is that I didn't believe that I was making an argumentum ad consequentium argument, and which by the way is one of the informal fallacies. So hopefully I wasn't intentionally doing that. I wasn't arguing that we should reject conspiracy theories as unwarranted on the grounds that doing so would erode our trust in institutions of public uh, uh, trust, right? That, that is not what I was trying to argue because that is a fallacious argument for him saying, don't believe in X, because if you believe in X, it's gonna have these bad consequences. So we don't want those bad consequences. So don't believe it. That's not a good argument for him. That is invalid. Instead, what I thought I was trying to make the argument and here, let me try to make it clear, I intended to make the case that in the case of at least some older and well-investigated conspiracy theories, uh, they should be rejected because the only way to continue to affirm them requires a prior degree of skepticism that seems hard to swallow. That it's not that belief in a particular conspiracy theory is going to erode your future trust in public institutions. It's that in order to take the claim seriously at all, you have to presume a prior distrust or a prior uh, unreliability of, of, um, of institutions of postal trust, uh, public trust in the first place. That it, and it requires a quite and, and, and in the case of certain conspiracy theories that are very old and well investigated and very broad, that the number of people that need to be involved in the conspiracy theory for it to be confirmed is going to require quite a lot of distrust of quite a lot of different individuals that has to be presupposed to even think that this conspiracy theory uh, is something that we should infer. And one of the things that dawned on me after I was uh, looking at other people's discussion of this public trust approach was to say that I was not actually thinking of deductive validity at all. I was thinking of philosophy of science. I was thinking of abduction, inference to best explanation, that, that what we're, why uh, we reject certain theories is because they involve uh, explanatory features that we don't like or think for other reasons should not be accepted. So that the kinds of things that you would have to do to accept certain uh, large and, and well-developed conspiracy theories as true would require accepting as part of the explanation something that just seems implausible and problematic for other reasons. So 
I also, and, and along with this, these two things go together, but the second thing I wanted to argue or, uh, as part of this was that, that in affirming certain unwarranted conspiracy theories, uh, that to do so requires a substantial degree of undermining of much else that you want to believe in other than the conspiracy theories, that you can't pick and choose necessarily the evidence that you're, uh, uh, that you're, you can't pick and choose and say, well, I believe this source of evidence when it is in support of something I want to believe, but I'm gonna discount it when it's in support of something I don't want to believe. I mean, if you're saying this is an untrustworthy source of information, then you need to treat it as an unworthy source of information more across the board, or at least you need to give us some principled uh, explanation as to why you are accepting sometimes when the news tells you things, and then other times you're rejecting what they tell you. And for me, the key quote that I gave in my paper that has always struck me as interesting that very few other people who wrote about my original paper picked up on this, because I thought it was such a great quote from uh, somebody who's a bit of a, of a fringe kind of thinker uh, as it is, but I still really like this quote from Robert Anton Wilson. Uh, and here, and so I'll just read the, the whole quote. Uh, this is me first talking. Consider another famous unwarranted conspiracy theory, the one claiming that the Holocaust never occurred and, it's, and that it is a fabrication of Jews and their sympathizers. Writing about this, Robert Anton Wilson correctly notes that a quote, or that quote, a conspiracy theory, and now I'm quoting him, a conspiracy theory that can deceive us about six million deaths can deceive us about anything and that it takes a great leap of faith for Holocaust revisionists to believe that World War II even happened at all, or that Franklin Roosevelt did serve as president from 1933 to 1945, or that Marilyn Monroe is more a, was more real than King Kong or Donald Duck. In the process of holding onto a belief, and now, now this is me talking again, in the process of holding onto a, uh, a belief in an increasingly massive conspiracy behind more and more public events, we undermine the grounds for believing in anything. At some point, we shall be forced to recognize the unwarranted nature of the conspiracy theory uh, if we are to be left with any warranted explanation or beliefs at all. The, the claim that um, Wilson is making is this claim that, okay, you can deny that the Holocaust happened, but then you need to explain to me why you thought World War II happened at all, because the same data historical evidence that is trotted out in favor of, of proof of the Holocaust is the same sources and evidence for the World War II itself, or that you know Franklin Roosevelt was the president, that you if you really want to throw out the evidence that it takes to throw out in order to make the uh, Holocaust denial argument plausible, then you better not have any claims about anything about World War II and or claims about Marilyn Monroe being real and so forth. And I think what Anthony Wilson is talking about here is the kind of self undermining aspect of certain things. So it's not about whether or not this is gonna force you to think in the future that uh, we shouldn't believe public institutions, but rather to try to, to really highlight, at least in the case of certain uh, unwarranted conspiracy theories, just how much has to be thrown into question such that, uh, that we find this believable. Uh, and find it to be not only warranted, but something that you should uh, affirm. And that's why I talked about it as being as kind of a form of epistemic nihilism, that the, the amount of things that have to be thrown into doubt uh, to believe at least certain uh, conspiracy theories uh, is just, uh, it's a very high price to pay. And I guess you could approve, uh, you know, pay that price, just the same as you could pay the price of saying, I don't really know that the world wasn't brought into existence five minutes ago. Uh, I don't really have evidence that it didn't. Uh, but wow, okay, why, what's my evidence for that? And, and if, if I really do want to take that seriously, then I end up just being uh, a radical skeptic who doesn't you know, have grounds to believe anything, which is always something you can do, but making it clear that, that at least with certain conspiracy theories that they border on that kind of skepticism, uh, that would have to be the case in order for the theory itself to be plausible. So that's my attempt to try to say what I was trying to say about the public trust argument. Um, so I just wanted to end, and this is uh, my last two slides, is I wanted to say something at the end about QAnon, uh, because that's the conspiracy theory that everybody is talking about. Um, and, and I think it's interesting with respect to the sorts of things that I've been talking about in conspiracy theories over the last 20 years, and many of my colleagues in conspiracy, conspiracy theory theory have been talking about. And because it does seem in some ways that QAnon might be importantly different. So, and, and this is mostly just speculation that I'm throwing out there to get the conversation going. 
Uh, first thing, I'll just note a couple of things. One thing is Joe Yasinski, the political scientist I mentioned before. Uh, he reports that he thinks that the QAnon uh, phenomenon is not nearly as widespread as uh, we are led to believe. Uh, that it, it's actually relatively few people that take it seriously, but they are very, very motivated people. Uh, and so that, that, uh, that they are strongly motivated and are very noisy. And as we saw uh, uh, on January 6th, uh, very motivated to, to, to act on this particular uh, set of ideas. Uh, but it might be a relatively fringe movement, maybe. That's what Joe is saying. Uh, we, you know, some of the data is still uh, yet to be collected. Um, the other things is I'm really not sure I want to class QAnon as a conspiracy theory in the same way that we've been talking about in this talk and uh, in, in other ways that we talk about conspiracy theories. For one thing, uh, it really seems to be a conglomeration of a bunch of different conspiracy theories that play a role uh, in it. I mean, conspiracy theories are clearly tied up in QAnon, but I don't know if the movement itself is best understood as a conspiracy theory. And one piece of evidence that I have for that is it, there was this really puzzling trope that you saw in the news uh, when people were reporting conversations with people who believed in QAnon. There was this reported lack of interest in who Q is. So I'm assuming most people know what QAnon is. There's this you know, person, Q, or maybe people, it might be multiple people, somebody posting anonymously on uh, the internet, uh, on certain message boards, Q, uh, 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 various message boards that uh, claims to be somebody inside the government, inside the deep state, as it were, uh, with special clearance and would leave uh, interesting little tidbits of, of information. And then there was always this open question as to exactly who is Q. And you would think that you would be interested if you thought that Q was all this important that you would want to know and make sure that Q is not a charlatan, make sure that Q is who uh, they say they are. Uh, but there was this lack of interest that several reporters noted, uh, which is not really the case you would think that if this were uh, being proposed as an explanation of events, you would want to know uh, this. Instead, it seems to be more of kind of an ideological signal that belief in QAnon, uh, profession of QAnon ideas is more about a, a political tribe membership marker saying that I'm on this team, I'm on team Trump, or I'm on a particular team, I'm against the, the liberals, rather than what we've been talking about up to this point, which is an attempt to offer an explanation of past events. I mean, it folds in different kinds of conspiracies, but again, it's not always clear to me that 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 the goal here is to try to explain why things have happened. Also, it's it's much more, it seems to be much more future oriented and action oriented than historically oriented the way that conspiracy theories typically are. And, and here's just the most provocative thing in my last, uh, last thing here is to think about maybe there's the possibility of a meta conspiracy theory, a conspiracy theory about conspiracies uh, and conspiracy theories that it has been suggested by some people that you know, perhaps the promotion of QAnon, both by the mysterious Q uh, themselves and by perhaps networks of foreign actors, that the, the promotion of QAnon is the result of an intentional attempt to either A, uh, reap profit in many forms, right, either to, as a money-making uh, activity, as a kind of a long con, as it were, or perhaps uh, to uh, uh, when power uh, politically and otherwise, and, and not necessarily or, and so general distrust in institutions of public trust uh, by Western citizens, uh, that particularly that might be one of the things that's behind the uh, international uh, connections to the promotion of QAnon in the United States and in other Western countries is that it may be part of a disinformation campaign that's goal is to uh, erode our trust in uh, public, uh, public trust in public institutions. So in conclusion, I think uh, even though I just backed away from the public trust approach, uh, I now wonder maybe I do support now, didn't before, but maybe now I do support at least a form of the public trust approach after all, because we, if this meta conspiracy is true, then the intention of, you know, it's not that you, the, the public trust is being eroded as some kind of side effect, of belief in conspiracy theories. But if it turns out that there's a conspiracy to actually target institutions of public trust in the West more generally, that could be a conspiracy theory that I could get behind. Uh, so maybe the PTA itself is a form of a conspiracy theory. 
So I have definitely gone over time. So let me stop there and see what kinds of questions people have. So thank, thank you, Brian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, the next step of uh, our event is to um, ask the panelists to turn on their cameras and microphones. And we're going to give um, our panelists, which is actually composed of future speakers in this lecture series and um, fellow international experts on the philosophy of conspiracy theory, uh, give a chance to ask uh, some questions to Brian or give their thoughts on his presentation. And then after that point, we'll open up uh, a discussion to the audience who can ask questions either of uh, the speaker, Brian Keeley, or the panelists. Shall I next start? Sure. Go for it, Em. Uh, so, I, so I suppose I, I should start because I want to do the whole mea culpa thing, because I suspect along with you, Paul Reicher, Lee Basham, I'm the other primary person who accused you of adopting the PTA approach in your work. Now, we've got PERS comms, which indicates that I've backtracked on that in my recent thinking, in part because having gone back to look at your paper of conspiracy theories, I think it's, I mean, you are right, you're not particularly clear when you move from the first two thirds of the paper to the last third, but in your credit, you're also, along with Charles, one of the first people to be writing on conspiracy th theory in the 90s, and you are basically having to invent the terminology to then explain the concept you want to explain. And so I think there's a kind of interesting move in your work, particularly in of conspiracy theories, where there's actually two senses of unwarranted being talked about when we talk about mature conspiracy theories. There's the sense of unwarranted in the kind of sense we often talk about unwarranted theories being theories which are just false. The evidence just isn't there. We ought not to believe them. But when we're talking about mature conspiracy theories, it's ambiguous as to whether a theory is unwarranted because it's false or unwarranted because evidence isn't yet available to show that it's plausible. And of course, your entire argument in of conspiracy theories is very much of the case of we should actually be investigating these claims because the whole problem with conspiracies is that people are hiding things in the background. I mean, uh, the analogy you make in of conspiracy theories is electrons don't actually lie about their super position. They're not being deceitful. It's just a factor of the way of our investigations. Human agents do. They frequently lie. Uh, so yeah, I want to do the whole mere cul culpa thing, especially since when it comes to the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, given that I'm cited incredibly frequently throughout there, I have a feeling that Mark Pauly may have got his impression of you from my impression of you, which means that there are now compounding, compounding factors there. It's so a conspiracy. My, You're all out to get me. That's all there is to it. I mean, I mean that is true, <laughs> but that's that's for a completely different <laughs> rationale. Uh, so the, the the question which I have, uh, which actually goes right back to your your final slide, uh, the idea of the public trust approach being a a conspiracy theory. I mean, how warranted? do you think a claim of that particular type is? So what would you want to see as evidence which warrants the idea that there are institutions out there which are trying to erode our trust in I IPTs? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's unwarranted in the sense that you were describing of it's still early days yet uh, in terms of, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of good evidence. I mean, there is some work uh, Kate Starbird, uh, as you probably know, did some work in uh, after the 2016 election, trying to figure out uh, where the disinformation was coming from uh, when it was there and whether it was being promoted, uh, you know, by uh, nefarious outside actors. I mean, it, it may turn out that it'll be sort of like the case of, of uh, things like the Tonkin Gulf uh, scenario, where it took many, many years and then Freedom of Information Acts and other sorts of things. The passage of time is pretty good at revealing evidence. And you know all the things that we learned about what the uh, former Soviet Union was getting up to after, after its collapse in 1989 and then all sorts of uh, uh, documents were released 
uh, you know, we might have to wait until the post-Putin era of, of uh, Russian politics. Uh, you know, if a, a, a new uh, regime moves in, they could open up the, uh, the archives in Moscow, and then we could look and see whether and to what extent, you know, the RT uh, publication was being fed information by, uh, you know, by the, the intelligence agencies there, uh, or who else might have been involved or not, right? It could also turn out that, you know, the enemy may be the West, right? That we, well, we may be doing it to ourselves. That's our, you know, that we're maybe, uh, they're not to blame much at all, at all. We don't know, uh, but I think it is unwarranted in the sense of we just don't have enough information one way or the other now. Uh, and, you know, I just hope I live long enough to uh, see the data. Like eventually we found out that there probably just weren't any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, that, you know, we've scoured the country pretty, pretty thoroughly after the invasion and it seems like they just never were there. Uh, so uh, sometimes time does tell uh, and I think we'll just have to see on this case as well. But I also just as a philosopher, I like the idea of a conspiracy theory about conspiracy theories. It's just kind of, it's nice and meta. It is, yes. Um, Brian, maybe I could go next. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Steve. Um, so can we go back to the slide where you talk about inference to the best explanation and the public okay. trust argument? Okay. Let me find it here. Got too many slides. Uh, is this one it? Yes, I think that's it. Is that it? Uh, yes, that's the one. Um, the way you've set that up, the only way to continue to affirm them requires a higher degree of skepticism that's hard, that's hard to follow. That looks like a transcendental argument to me, <laughs> rather than reference to the best explanation. Um, so, look, I'm thinking I'm one of the people who criticised you on this, although I can't quite remember because it's a long time ago. I'd have to go back and, uh, and look, but uh, maybe you've got a sort of hit list of people who've done this. Um, if I was, then um, I'm still a bit suspicious because that looks to me like something much stronger than a mere inference to the best explanation. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, I, you know, I, to be completely honest, I'm not sure what is the relationship between transcendental arguments and, and inference to best explanation. Uh, I mean, I, I imagine if Kant was aware of, of arguments to the best explanation, he might've tried to claim that is in fact what he was trying to do. Uh, I mean, it's a metaphysical version of, I mean, usually an inference to best explanation is, uh, is usually an empirical context. And now that you mention it, I just realized that, you know, famous, well, I don't know if it's famous, but abduction comes from the work of C.S. Peirce, uh, Charles Saunders Peirce in the United mm -hmm. States, an early American philosopher. And he, is in, in his biographical and autobiographical material argues that you can't understand his work without understanding that he spent a lot of time studying Kant. Uh, so, uh, you know, ironically, in a lot of ways, since, you know, it seems like Persian scientific uh, pragmatism doesn't seem to have anything at all to do with, uh, uh, with Kant, even though he thinks that the, he claims that the term pragmatism actually comes from the German translation of the Critique of Practical Reason, I believe uh, that it's the same. Uh, so he actually sees all sorts of interesting connections between abductive arguments and and Kantian type arguments. So maybe I'd be willing to bite that bullet and say, yeah, maybe there is a connection here. It's just you know there might be it might be a subtler well, difference between them. Let let me try and um, spell this out a bit more then. So. Um, it looks like there's a stronger claim being made here than just this is really the best explanation. The claim mm. is, you know, um, the only way, this is the only possibility rather mm. than mm. of the various possibilities, this mm. is the most plausible one. So that sounds like something stronger than mere inference to the best explanation. Okay, fair, yeah, that's, that's fair enough. So, uh, so I would probably, yeah, I, I, probably cop to that and say that, yeah, maybe I need to tone that down and not talk about being the only way. Uh, I mean, it partly depends on, you know, how, how broad you want your ad hoc 
uh, claims to be in order to kind of preserve. I mean, there's there's also an element of, of Lakatos and philosophy of science here where, you know, you can hold on to a particular view as long as you're willing to countenance all sorts of ad hoc uh, claims to go along with it. And and this is a particularly, I, at least I want to argue that the idea that, well, the New York Times and the FBI and, uh, you know, Stanley Kubrick and all these people are in on it. They have to be in on it because I really want to believe or I really believe this theory to be true. Uh, and the only way it could be true is if all of those people were in on it. It's like, well, that's starting to seem like a really broad uh, ad hoc hypothesis that you're having to throw out there, an auxiliary hypothesis to, to save your theory. Uh, is it the, I, I think you're right. Maybe it's not the only one. There's always a variety of different other ad hoc uh, hypotheses that you could come up with. Uh, it's not the only one, but at the same time, I think the rest of the point about, yeah, but it's, it's a lot has to be called into question to, to come up with any kind of a sensible explanation. Okay. Thanks. Sure. I don't know, Charles, you got anything for me? Oh, yes. Before I begin, Mark, I believe it's your birthday. Or was that yesterday? Oh, it was today. Thank you. Um, Happy birthday. I guess for Facebook. Yeah, Facebook mutual friends. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> oh, no, it's it's not actually so much that. It's um, it's you're a former uh, classmate of my colleague, uh, mm. Mike Leboeuf. Oh, OK. Yeah, thanks. That's how I know. Anyway, happy birthday. Um, Look, this is a, an excellent talk, uh, really interesting, about the public trust approach. The problem with it is um, that, um, like, like the approach, of whether, like the question of defining conspiracy theories uh, where, by whether or not they contradict an official story, something is an official story in one place and uh, um, uh, not an official story in another place. So, you know, it's not, it doesn't give you a well-defined category. It's not quite the same with the public trust approach. Of course, um, there are places where if you say, well, it's not just the FBI or the CIA or the government um, or the New York Times or, you know, the whole media uh, have to be in on it for this to be the case. And that's really, really implausible and means that you are kind of committing epistemic suicide because what can you possibly believe? There are places where really everybody is in on it. You know, if you're in Stalinist Russia and, you know, Stalin um, or the news media says something or other um, and you're suspicious of it, uh, it's true that um, it's going to be confirmed by every other um, media source. Um, but that's because they really are all in on it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, so, you know, the, in some places you really shouldn't tr trust these public um, uh, organizations whose apparent job it is to verify uh, facts. So although, of course, you're right, you know, that in the sense that there are some places where we can say in this case, this really is kind of problematic. Uh, you, so many people have to be in on it, and we have reason to think that they are not collaborating to the mm. degree you think they are. Mm. Um, uh, and you are then in a position where you say, well, what do we believe? You know, how, we, um, how do we pick and choose? I'll come back to that point in a moment. There are people who have been in a situation where they are right to distrust all these bodies or analogs of all these bodies taken together, like people in Stalinist Russia or, you know, uh, Nazi Germany, for example. Um, all these um, media outlets, all these um, uh, sources for investigating uh, what's going on are in the hands of the government and are being coerced and orchestrated into singing the same song. Uh, so that's a problem. It, it's not that this isn't, and, and this is, I think, the, the real difficulty with um, distinguishing between good and bad or warranted and unwarranted conspiracy theories. There are lots of things that we can say, markers of bad conspiracies, 
But there as it were no silver bullets. In, in almost every case you can think of an instance where uh, a conspiracy theory which violates one of your requirements for a good conspiracy theory is in fact a good conspiracy theory in the circumstances in which the person develops it, puts it forward. Um, uh, so, and the, also the issue of trust, this actually comes up in history right? because we're often operating with sources um, who we're pretty sure are lying, exaggerating in various ways. So a good example, a major source for the role of the emperor, for the reign of the emperor Justinian is something I mentioned in my first article on conspiracy theories. It's Procopius's The Secret History. And that starts off with the hypothesis that uh, Justinian and his wife are in fact demons in human form who've conspired to, uh, by their policies to depopulate the Mediterranean. Uh, and, and that's not all. It's got lots and lots of other sort of crazy conspiratorial stuff in it. But it is our major source or one of our major sources for the reign of Justinian. And the other major source is the other books that Procopius wrote. So, so you know, we are, we are in the position where obviously we don't believe that crazy nonsense. Um, but um, uh, how do we, but we are forced to be reliant on Procopius for a great deal of what we take ourselves to know mm -hmm. about that, that period. So um, it, it's not, you know, I want to say your this public trust approach is rubbish or, or anything. It's just it's not quite as cut and dried as you might like to make it. Um, so because of the, let's say, the Procopius problem and the, the, the Stalin's Russia problem. So these are two distinct problems. Mm -hmm. uh, final point that I wanted to make is um, quite a lot of um, that will be quite QAnon is not unique. Um, my favorite example of a conspiracy to promote a conspiracy theory is the um, uh, Stalin's Great Terror. And what mm. happens in the Great Terror is that uh, Stalin promotes um, a, a conspiracy theory to the effect that uh, the Soviet Union is being menaced by a, 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 con a conspiracy of Trotskyists and, and rightists, the, Bukharin, uh, the Bukharinists and the Trotskyists together. And what they're trying to do is to subvert the Soviet Union um, and this conspiracy has been detected by the vigilance of the security apparatus and the conspirators, those of them who are within the reach of, of Stalin's power, are being arrested and forced to confess. So that's a conspiracy to promote a conspiracy theory, hmm. or rather a set of conspiracy theories. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure QAnon is not unique. Hmm. Um, it would be interesting to th think of well, you might say that um, this is a bit more difficult. You might say that McCarthyism hmm. was a conspiracy to promote false conspiracy theories, except you have the problem that people are often taken in by their own propaganda. You know, it hmm. seems that McCarthy really did believe this. And of course, the complication of the McCarthy case is if, if we accept what's said by somebody you mentioned, namely um, uh, Catherine Olmsted, mm. is um, at the time that he was pushing this line, there was no major conspiracy on the part of communists to penetrate um, uh, the, the, uh, the American establishment. Mm. There had been one mm. a few years earlier, and it was shut down. Mm. And why was it shut down? Well, uh, the Red Spy Queen, uh, uh, who was involved in this genuine conspiracy, uh, spilled the beans to the FBI. And because of a, uh, the fact that there was a conspiratorial press penetration as British security apparatus in the form of the Cambridge spies, mm. I can't remember which one, whether it's Burgess or Philby, was actually in on her interrogation, tipped off his handlers, and, and the Soviets basically shut the whole thing down. Wow. Now that's, um, um, uh, uh, but uh, 
McCarthyism is kind of a meta conspiracy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a little less clear because um, um, the, the, the element of um, um, secrecy, you know, there's some secrecy involved, um, but, um, you know, how much planning was that, how much people just like going with their gut. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I, uh, I suppose the, the general point I, I want, would want to make is that, yes, uh, meta conspiracies are, are not as, as rare as you might think. And we've got quite good historical examples of such things. Oh, thank you, Charles. That was great. And also that's another, you know, you're, you're pointing to the importance of looking to history if you really want to, you know, there's the data for you. Um, and, I, and there's a bunch of stuff in what you said. I, I, I have a couple of responses. One is uh, when I talk about epistemic nihilism, you know, the situation where we just don't know what to believe. Uh, I mean, sometimes that is the situation we're in. I mean, I think actually that is the kind of situation we're in in a lot of the historical cases, like you were just describing where, you know, I mean, as philosophers, we're all familiar with the paucity of information we have about Socrates. You know, it's basically four sources, you know, not even four, it's really three sources. And we have a secondhand source in, in Aristotle, perhaps, who gives us kind of some hearsay information about him. But, you know, it's basically Plato uh, and uh, I always forget his name, the- uh, uh, Xenophon. Xenophon, yeah. And it's like, that's it, right? We don't, and, and in terms of, there's lots of questions we, we have about Socrates that we're just probably never gonna know the answer to because we simply, uh, don't have uh, sufficient trustworthy sources in which to believe. Uh, but I think that's also a case where we're not in some sense choosing to be uh, epistemic nihilist. Uh, it's just like, that's just the situation we find ourselves in. Similarly, if you're in Stalinist Russia or the example I always like to give is Argentina in the 1970s, where you're in a society in which, yeah, the, the institutions, the would be institutions of public trust are just fundamentally uh, not doing that, <laughs> they're, they're, they're serving some other interests other than the truth, then you may find yourself in a situation where you are much like a radical skeptic. You don't know what to believe because you have no source of information that, that is trustworthy. Uh, I still think that's different from a case where, uh, you know, where you're kind of in some sense going out of your way to say, oh, it's because, you know, in, in a form of a motivated kind of belief idea that like, I really seem to want to want this to be true. And then I'm piling on more and more epistemic nihilism in order to, you know, right. and that. So, it, so, uh, I mean, uh, go ahead. the thought that occurred to me, I mean, would we look at those books about Stalinist Russia, written from within Stalinist Russia or slightly afterwards when things were opening up a little bit. So you'd look at, at uh, Medvedev, Let History Judge, or Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago. Um, there, they, they're using sources, often government sources, to reveal what is being concealed or passed over. Mm -hmm. or, or de-emphasized mm -hmm. um, so that would be uh, you know they would be paradigms of because basically what they've discovered is as uh, you know kind of held up right mm -hmm. we, we don't think that Medvedev and um, and Solzhenitsyn are substantially wrong uh, now that lots of the archives have opened up we think they're basically right you know they get some details wrong but you know mm -hmm. sound guys mm -hmm. um, um, uh, uh, that would be, as it were, how to proceed <laughs> in one of these challenged environments. We have paradigms of how to do it. Um, there is also, of course, when you look at um, uh, history far back, you can look at the archaeological records sometimes to to mm -hmm. tell you about. Yeah. What, yeah. Um, um, so that's that. And the, uh, again, it's interesting that the paradigm of how to do this somebody who, well, is, 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 is a philosopher, it's R.G. Collingwood. Mm. So Collingwood, in his historical works, or his works on the philosophy of history, casts um, uh, a lot of shade on what he calls scissors and paste history, where you just, you know, you've got a bunch of sources and 
you try and pull together a coherent narrative where they conflict. And he's, he, he's very scornful of this. And he says, lots of people are like this, you know, including Edward Gibbon. He's got it in for Edward Gibbon. Um, and um, uh, he, uh, in his book on Roman Britain, which is very good, he takes, you know, all these historical um, narratives um, of uh, the Roman invasion, the Roman occupation, and uh, also things which are, uh, like lists of court appointments and officials and ranks, and then interrogates them in the light of archaeology, mm. and also rational reconstruction. So, you know, what would it be a plausible thing for a Roman official to be trying to do in these circumstances? Yeah. So we've got sort of accounts of how to do this, but it's all kind of messy and detailed, yeah. and paradigms, and and it's hard to draw general lessons. To distinguish between, you know, good conspiracy theories and bad, that um, you know, we're probably going to talk a bit more about this. I've got one idea, but I don't think it's enough any more than the sorts of things that you talk about are enough. So, uh, I think that if you have um, a a, a, cons a conspiracy can be defectible or not. It's defectible if the costs of defecting from the conspiracy are low and the rewards are high and it's not defectible if it's the other way around right? so uh, if you've got a conspiracy theory which features a highly defectible conspiracy from which according to the conspiracy theory there are no defections that's an implausible conspiracy theory uh, that's a, a reason to take it as 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 unwarranted but even here, there's a problem. So suppose you say, well, um, uh, the moon landing hoax theory is, um, is a highly defectible but non-defective conspiracy. Suppose it were a conspiracy um, and you defected from this conspiracy and you, you spilled the beans to the newspapers. Um, uh, you'd be on the gravy train for life, you know, shining on the talk shows and all the rest of it. Uh, uh, but then, once, then, then somebody adds an extra auxiliary hypothesis to the theory and says, yes, but you forget about the moon landing death squads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you think, well, mm -hmm. you know, of course, we can evaluate that in the light of general plausibility, but what is generally plausibility, plausible is going to depend on your overall view of the historical situation and what sort of society you live in yeah or you just go remember edward snowden did it so uh you know so. Uh, yeah um i mean i mean but how did he do it by just dumping lots of data yeah, he yeah. yeah he's a very interesting case and and could have gotten himself killed <laughs> i mean it could and could have gotten himself killed and he certainly um <laughs> Um, having to hide out in the Soviet Union in order to not get himself prosecuted and sent to jail for long periods. Yes. Although, of course, some people say that Edward Snowden was a controlled leak, mm -hmm. and thus it was designed to make us think the system has these safeguards, but actually they just let us knew the, the least worst things. Mm -hmm. You can always rescue it with this kind of weird additional yeah. thing like your moon landing death squads. So, Norma, Mark, should we uh, turn to some questions, or how do you want to handle? Uh, yeah, thanks, Brian, and thanks, everyone, for the comments. Uh, why don't we open up to the audience? I see some questions posted in the Q&A. Um, I think Nathan's question might be a good way to start, because hmm. going back to the beginning of your talk about terminology, he writes, Brian, in your early uh, graph, you listed flat earth as a conspiracy theory. Does that meet your criterion of a group of people conspiring? Yes, so that's a funny one, I will admit. Uh, and the and, and I used to exactly think that what you're thinking is like, wait a minute, flat earth is just a theory about whether the earth is flat or not. There's no conspiracy there. That's like getting hit by a meteor. It's, an, you know, it's a claim about a natural phenomenon. Except that if you look at, at work on flat earth, the only way the flat earth theory works is if NASA is lying to us. 
right? All those photos that we're getting from the space station and whatnot. I mean, clearly, if you were up in, I mean, the guy who died a couple of months ago trying to blast a rocket up into space so that he could actually get up high enough to see the Earth is flat and not have curvature and it didn't go well and he died, right? The idea is if he could get up high enough, he could see that the Earth was a big disk. But wait a minute, you know, the space station is up there. So they should be able to see that it's a big disk, but they're not telling us. So the conspiracy is NASA and, and the European Space Agency and the Chinese Space Agency, they're all lying to us, faking photos from, uh, from space, as it were, uh, that just the same as they faked the moon landing. And there's a big conspiracy there to make us believe that the moon landing actually happened. Similarly, uh, the same people actually, you know, one leads to the other, right? It's the same people who lied to us about the moon landing are also now lying to us about the fact that the earth is, they're claiming that the earth is a sphere for some reason. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's, that's the conspiracy in the case of, uh, of the flat earth. Thank you. Uh, there's two more questions that are posted now, but everyone should feel free to post more. There's a question from Ava. I'll just read it out. Brian, I think you can see it though. Maybe everyone else can't. She writes, to further M's point about there simply being a lack of evidence to justify characterizing a UCT as a WCT, how do we decide which conspiracy theories are worth investigating for further evidence of bad intentions? On the one hand, it feels like there's a great benefit to be gained by diving deep into these alternative explanations for events because of how often individuals in power do choose to cover up nefarious activity. On the other hand, how much of our resources should, should be dedicated the challenging absurd arguments, especially when it comes to verified scientific evidence. Mm -hmm. Good, well, uh, one thing I can do is a bit of advertising because I think Em and I wrote a paper on this topic. Uh, and, uh, but uh, on, yeah, exactly when is investigation called for? Uh, and it's, yeah, it's not a, there's, again, there's not a nice cut and dried answer. Uh, I mean, in, in and I, I'm partly, I, I just want to say it's a good question, right? Because there's also questions about resources, right? We, you know, we don't have an infinite number of resources, so therefore we can't spend a billion dollars investigating any particular conspiracy theory. Uh, so how do we best marshal our resources? Well, I mean, I, I wonder if you know, we, you know, could have, uh, you know, just the same as we have a, a consumer reports, right, a, 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 a organization that makes money by, uh, you know, by publishing uh, information on products, and then people subscribe to it and support it, uh, that, you know, maybe we could have a, a similar kind of organization for the investigation of conspiracy theories. I mean, in some sense, that's what the Washington Post already is. That's what 60 Minutes already is, uh, is an organization that tries to figure out like what can we uh, investigate and what might get us a Pulitzer Prize if we uncover some great conspiracy uh, that people didn't realize was the case. And we can, you know, Woodward and Bernstein did pretty good, you know, in terms of their career uh, by, you know, digging into a conspiracy and exposing it and pulling up the evidence. Uh, except for, you know, Charles's death squads that you have to worry about. Uh, you know, you could do quite well for yourself by uh, doing the right kinds of investigation. But, uh, yeah, I don't know if M, you want to jump in because I know M has also thought about uh, you know when is investigation called for and when not. Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I do. I do have thoughts on this. So, in the final chapter of the edited volume I helped produce back in 2018, I talk about how we could take a kind of Deweyan community of inquiry approach towards having kind of standing committees which are investigating conspiratorial claims, which are kind of ongoing thing made up of diverse members drawn from all parts of society, including people who fervently believe certain conspiracy theories, because you want the reports they produce to come from a kind of body where there's a feeling it wasn't it wasn't set out to generate a particular outcome. There was always serious consideration of an issue. And I think this has the benefit, it does allow us to investigate what appear to be really fantastical or fanciful conspiracy theories seriously. So for example, I don't think we are controlled by alien shape-shifting reptiles from another dimension, a la the kind of views that David Icke espouses. But imagine if we investigated it and it turned out to be true. 
it sounds like the kind of thing we ought to put a stop to. And yet often we think it's ludicrous and thus unwarranted by definition. But sometimes you actually need to engage in an investigation. There's a kind of worry, and I'll talk about this in my talk later on in the season, about what happens when you start publicly talking about fanciful conspiracy theories that nonetheless have deleterious social consequences, like some of the conspiracy theories about the origin and transmission of COVID-19. But you kind of do need people investigating things in the background nonetheless, because even if something turns out to be fanciful, if it turns out to be true, we've learned something really interesting. And we also may have learned about something that we need to control for. Yeah, I'm also reminded of the, uh, you know, the Catholic Church having, uh, basically, they have a team of people that investigate reports of miracles, right? And, and they're, and I think it's mostly Jesuits, I think it might be a, a Jesuit group, but their whole thing is when somebody reports a miracle in the Catholic Church, they go and investigate, and part of their motivation is almost, I mean, to put it cynically, it's almost a, a, a quality control thing, that they, it's not that they think that miracles never happen. They actually do think that miracles do in fact happen, but they worry that they don't want people to not think that miracles are happening because they're not being diligent in their uh, in, in what they claim to be a miracle or not. So the whole idea of, of the uh, investigation team is to go in and do everything in their power to show that it's a hoax, to show that it is not a genuine miracle, that it is something else, such that if after, you know, almost in a Cartesian uh, first meditation sort of way that like in the crucible of investigation, trying to doubt it in all sorts of ways, if you fail to do that, then what's left behind are things that you really ought to think are real miracles. Uh, but that, that it's somewhat incumbent on the Catholic Church in defense of its own faith to, in a good faith effort, investigate miracles in order to disprove as many of them as possible and thereby make us, you know, believe what's left over. Similarly, you know, I look at the, you know, the 9-11, you know, the, the truthers, engineers for truth and things like that. It's like, great, set up a you know, thing where you just go out and every time somebody comes up with conspiracy theory, study the heck out of it because you want to prove all the other conspiracies are false such that, you know, the, when an equal amount of investigation is done in your conspiracy theory, you go like, we haven't, you know, our conspiracy looks good in comparison uh, instead of being, you know, just looking at your own conspiracy theories, but to, to have a group of skeptics who, want to prove as many of them wrong who you know because they want people to believe the conspiracies that are left great we have a time for a couple more questions i have a question from sean which i can read out um he writes what should we do about conspiracy theories like the one that says that vaccines are actually filled with poison and microchips if we have an attitude of well we'll wait and see if this is true or not as more evidence comes out, this can cause a lot of harm because it delays creating herd immunity during a pandemic. Shouldn't we take a strong approach and say, that's such a ridiculous position that I'm not going to dignify that by taking it seriously and examining the arguments in the same way many scientists won't debate creationists? Hmm. I mean, I think in some sense, you know, uh, I'm not sure if there is a good answer for this sort of, of case, right? It's like, I, yeah, I fully admit that, you know, an academic like me that comes along and says, you know, I'm mostly interested in historical events. I'm interested in uh, trying to understand whether certain historical events were conspiracies or not, or theories about those conspiracies, uh, those former events happen. That doesn't help us necessarily in thinking about these kind of more future oriented uh, scenarios. Like, what do we do about you know, exactly this kind of a case. Problem is, I don't know what other answer is there that's a good one, because you can say something like, you know, that's just ridiculous, we're not going to dignify it by taking it seriously. That might work, except in those cases where then every, a large portion of the possible of people say that I'm just, well, since you're not challenging this conspiracy theory, uh, I'm going to assume that that means it's true. And then we end up not getting heard, uh, you know, herd immunity because such a large group of people uh, simply don't want to, to, to do it because there's an unchallenged conspiracy theory out there. And it's even worse because as some uh, social scientists have pointed out, I think it's uh, Brendan Nyan, a political scientist who's made this uh, claim the strongest, is there is this thing that's called the backfire effect, which is that in the, you know, when presented with a false claim, 
and then you go and attempt to de debunk that claim, right? Do a fact check of one sort or another. The paradoxical effect is the backfire effect where often the people that hear the debunking information end up believing in the original thing more than they did beforehand. And so we're, you know, we're, we're in the vagaries of, of the irrationalities of human psychology, which leaves us in a rather difficult situation to figure out, particularly in a free society where we're giving people the option to, you know, either submit to a vaccine or not. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think there is any clear, you know, winning answer here, uh, you know, that almost anything you can think to do you know, if, if there were an obvious answer, we'd be doing it. <laughs> and, and the part of the problem is there isn't a clear and obvious answer that maintains kind of our uh, democratic ideals. Uh, I mean, the other option is simply to, you know, you know take away people's insurance if they don't uh, get the, uh, the vaccine or otherwise uh, coerce them into getting the vaccine for their own good and being a paternalistic state. That, that's an option, uh, but that has other costs that would be paid. But can I res respond a bit uh, temperamentally, but I don't know if I've got an argument for this. I I'm with Richard Dawkins with respect to creationists. You know, I'm just rereading his book, The Greatest Show on Earth, which is precisely meant to argue for standard evolutionary theory. He's not pushing his own selfish Gene Barrow here. He's just pushing general evolutionary theory as uh, and the modern synthesis. Um, and uh, he argues directly against the creationists in that book. And I'm, I think that's the right strategy, but because of the backfire effect, and you know, um, I, I can't say for sure, it's just uh, a democratic article of faith, you might say, mm -hmm. that, yeah. that that's the way to go. Um, uh, uh, so that would be my response, but I don't have, as I say, I don't have like anything to back this up. Um, yeah, yeah, Charles. I'm not sure you're the person that needs to be convinced. The... <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, um, but you know, I, I, I was just looking at Dawkins. I think it's a good book, you know, but <laughs> not such a great book when you're actually arguing with creationists. Who knows? Mm -hmm. All right, listen. Uh, we have time for one last question, um, and I think it might be a good one to end with because it seems like pushing back on the generalist side of the debate. Uh, so Sean writes. Won't it nearly always be rational to dismiss conspiracy theories because it'll always be more likely there is a non-conspiracy explanation, even if you don't know what it is? Example, I don't need to know why the 9-11 towers collapsed the way they did because it's more likely there's a normal explanation we don't know about compared to the odds that 9-11 was an inside job. Yeah, so one of the things that's always, you know, there's always the Bayesian analysis in the background, like what are your priors coming into a, a, a given scenario where you're trying to figure out, okay, I've, I'm, I'm hearing competing explanations of what happened, and what are my priors about this, right? Because that's, if that's all I got to go on, my priors are going to swamp other bits of evidence. And, and a number of different uh, folks who talk about conspiracy theories think that this is you know, often going to be the case that, that, that a lot of it, and I think um, Lee Basham, I think is somebody who uh, has made arguments along these lines that, you know, if you're, if you're a particular kind of person with a particular kind of background, your priors are that there are conspiracies everywhere. Uh, and in particular, you know, you might have, you know, specific reasons to distrust certain institutions. Like, so the, I, the, the institution of public trust that I'm suggesting, right? If you are uh, a, a person of color, in the United States, uh, you, on the basis of your interactions with the police force, right, you're going to have certain prior uh, feelings about and prior beliefs based on that experience with how trustworthy the police are when they make a particular claim, right? Whether you think that there's a, you know, uh, a blue, blue shield of silence that is uh, uh, allows the police to have conspiracies against uh, the, the non-police public, right? Whereas somebody with a different set of priors who lives in a different kind of a world or, you know, lives in a different kind of privileged position in the world are going to have a different set of priors. So, uh, so one of the things that's, yeah, that's always in the background here is that when you don't have a lot of information to go on, 
right? What, what you think of as a normal explanation, right? For some people, the normal explanation is, of course, the government did it. The government does all sorts of bad things left and right. Have you heard about the Tuskegee experiments? Have you heard about, you know, you know or read any number of Charles's papers, right? He, he lays out to you all the history of all sorts of dastardly things that governments have gotten up to and businesses have gotten up to. Uh, and if that's the history you're coming to, your priors are gonna be such that you're gonna say, yeah, it's, you should go with the normal explanation. The normal explanation is that there was a conspiracy because that's what you normally see. But of course, somebody else is gonna look at that same information through a different lens and they're gonna like, well, my priors are different, right? And, uh, and it's, so I, I don't think we can always say that it's gonna be rational one way or the other. Uh, a lot of it depends on what prior information, what prior situation, uh, how you see the world beforehand, uh, that's gonna determine whether or not you think this is uh, a plausible thing or not, right? What constitutes the normal explanation and how you know how much credence you should give to official explanations you know it's a function of a lot of things and that's part of the reason why different populations of people uh within a society have different attitudes towards not just conspiracy theories in general but conspiracy theories about different things right so certain people uh, are more likely to believe conspiracy theories about what the police are up to. Other people are going to have conspiracy or believe conspiracy theories about what the 1% are up to, right? I think that's part of what's going on in the background of Bill Gates's thing is like, there are some people that just don't trust wealthy people, right? And Bill Gates is about as wealthy as it gets. So therefore he's about, you know, he's not trustworthy at all. Uh, other people think that the way you can tell whether a lawyer is lying is that their mouth is, you know, their lips are moving, right? They have prior uh, negative feelings about the conspiratorial uh, abilities of lawyers, right? And it's, it's, it's one of the reasons why dealing with conspiracy theories is, is so problematic is, again, it's, it's humans and their relationship to the world uh, is multivarious. And, and it's one of the reasons why I worry that the journalist account is is problematic because you know people are different people the experiences that people bring to the table are are very different as well can i can i reply um so short answer to your questioner no um <laughs> no in the sense that there's always a better non-conspiratorial explanation there are many things for which there just isn't a non-conspiratorial explanation so take 9 11 you've got basically um, a range of conspiracy theories, but there's no way that um, those planes were rammed into the um, um, uh, Twin Towers without somebody conspiring to do it. There's not like an invisible hand explanation as opposed to the hidden hand explanation mm -hmm. to account for it. So what you've got is uh, the uh, official conspiracy theory, which is that it was a conspiracy on the part of Al Qaeda um, and then you've got uh, a range of unofficial conspiracy theories, which says that it's a conspiracy on the part of Al Qaeda with some degree of connivance on the part of uh, uh, people within the uh, American security apparatus. Right? But there's no non conspiracy theory here. Yeah. Or to take a really, really contemporary example, uh, 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 Congresswoman, uh, I think, Aisha Presley. Uh, said that um, during the invasion of, of, of the Capitol building, she discovered that the panic buttons in her office had been uh, ripped out. Now, unless we're going to um, have some weird theory about you know, it being a mistake by the maintenance people, it's very unlikely that there's a non-conspiratorial explanation of this. The other thing to remember is that when there is an alternative explanation to a conspiracy theory, and it, which isn't simply another conspiracy theory, um, uh, it's an invisible hand explanation, right? So you've got some invisible hand mechanism that's generating the result that you might think people are planning secretly to bring about. The trouble with that is often there's no plausible invisible hand explanation, right? So Invisible hand explanations, you know, this is knowing about invisible hand explanations is crucial to understanding the social world, right? Lots of what happens happens because of invisible hand ex, um, mechanisms, either lifting you up or slapping you down. So, you know, they're really, 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 really important. And, you know, I, I teach a course on political economy because where this is, you know, what we hammer home. But 
they're not omnipotent. They can't explain everything. And often there is no plausible invisible hand explanation as a rival to a conspiratorial explanation. So um, uh, those two things there, uh, and oh, uh, think of the case again, the one I've already alluded to, um, uh, what was going on during the great terror under Stalin. There's no non-conspiratorial explanation. There's the official uh, theory that um, a band of uh, Trotskyist rightists uh, saboteurs are trying to undermine the Soviet economy and the Soviet state. That's conspiracy theory. Or there's the conspiracy that Stalin and his minions have faked the appearance of such a conspiracy. But there's no other kind of explanation of this. So uh, um, the answer is no. <laughs> there is um, often uh, no alternative or no non-conspiratorial plausible alternative to some conspiracy theories. And I think in the case of Popper, who we mentioned was the kind of first person, his, his alternative often was the cock up, right? That they, that instead of in claiming that there's ill intent, that there was some kind of mistake. But I think to Charles's point, it's hard to understand how a cock up could have led to 9-11, right? It's like, that, that's, there. It, it seems like that's just an implausible explanation of, of something so complicated uh, and, and you know, then, so the I think Popper's favorite alternative is is just not a is a non-starter in a lot of the cases we're interested in. Yeah. All right. Well, listen. Uh, thank you, Brian, and thank you to our panelists, and thank you to all the attendees who who came tonight. Um, and we are going to um, have another round of our mini series um, on March seventeenth, and we'll be taking the lead role and. Brian will become a, a panelist. And so hopefully everyone will return for that event and the events following. So uh, again, thanks to everyone. And I'll see you uh, in less than a month for the next round. <laughs>